Welcome wilderness explorers, it's Miss Gisa, and today we are at Death Valley National Park at the Furnace Creek Visitor Center. Death Valley National Park is part of the Mojave Desert. The park lies between California and Nevada and is one of the hottest, driest places on earth. Because it gets so hot here, the best time to visit is during the fall, winter, and spring before the temperatures get unbearable. Do you know why we call this area a national park? National parks are protected places that are set aside to be preserved so that everyone now and in the future will be able to enjoy and learn from them. Each park is unique and teaches us about either an important habitat, a historical event that took place there, or people who lived here long ago. Did you know approximately 1 million people visit Death Valley National Park each year? Now, before we go any further, let's discuss the word desert. Some people think a desert is covered by lots of sand, but not all deserts have sand. Land can be covered by broken rocks and stones, or even snow, and still be considered a desert. Desert is any place that is very, very dry and hardly rains. Did you know that Death Valley gets less than two inches of rainfall per year? Most of the rain evaporates into the air. Deserts are always dry, but they're not always hot. Antarctica is technically the Earth's largest desert. The largest, hottest desert on Earth is the Sahara Desert, which covers most of North Africa. Death Valley is a hot desert where temperatures can rise to 135 degrees in the summer and 65 degrees in the winter. The ground here gets even hotter. Can you guess just how hot? If you guessed around 200 degrees, you'd be right. During our trip through Death Valley, you will see that there are mountains, rocks, salt flats, and sand. You'll also see cactus plants and other brush. Death Valley lies between two big mountain ranges, the Panamint Mountains and the Amargosa Mountain Range. Only certain kind of tough plants, wildflowers, and animals have adapted to survive in the desert. Let's take a look at a few of the animals. The raven, The heron, bats, which like to come out at night, the desert tortoise, a kangaroo rat. The scorpion, and my favorite, the pupfish. But other animals also live here in Death Valley, like the chiquala, roadrunners, ground squirrels, owls, coyotes, and even snakes. We won't see many animals during the day because they have adapted to life in Death Valley and are more active at night when it's cooler. Be sure to watch our other episode on Death Valley and the food chains that are present here to learn more about the animals. Before visiting a national park or any new place, I like to read books about where I'm going. You can get these books from the library or you can click the links below. Let's go over some of the special books I've picked out to prepare you for a visit to Death Valley. The first book is called Exploring the Night Sky. And this is a great book if you're going to be in Death Valley at night or do some camping because it talks about the stars and the constellations and what you'll see here at night. Death Valley, A Day in the Desert is a great book for beginners. I would say preschool into lower elementary school. 
Death Valley National Park, a true book, is really great for preschoolers and also elementary age students. Um, it's got wonderful pictures and just a little text on each page, so it'll keep your readers engaged. Welcome to Death Valley National Park also has some beautiful pictures. The text in this book is a little more complex, so maybe for the older elementary school students, although younger students may like to just look at the pictures. I love the National Park Explorers series. This one's on Death Valley, and this one is perfect for preschool age into elementary school age. The pictures are gorgeous, and the text is simple. This cave art, the first paintings book, is great if you're going to go see some of the petroglyphs here in the park. Just beware that if you are gonna go hunt these petroglyphs down, you will need a four-wheel drive and a high-clearance vehicle. Now, this National Parks of the United States book is excellent. It goes through many of the national parks and it has beautiful illustrations um, and you can use it for every national park you go visit. And last but not least, these two books I like to recommend for either the older reader, middle or high schoolers, and even adults. These books go over several different national parks. One of the things I learned while researching this magnificent park is that the Shoshone people lived here for a very long time. They moved to the mountains during the summer. Other Native Americans lived in Death Valley before the miners came looking for gold. Be sure to catch our National Park episodes. The episode on Joshua Tree also shows more of the Mojave Desert as well as the Colorado Desert. You'll want to stop in at the Furnace Creek Visitor Center to grab a park map, their visitor guide, and two Junior Ranger books. One is the Junior Ranger book that is for Death Valley, and the other one is the Junior Ranger Night Explorer book, which you can do here at Death Valley, Joshua Tree, or any other national parks where you can see the beautiful night sky and the stars. Once you've completed your Junior Ranger book, you can take an oath and get your badge. In addition to the badge you'll earn, we, as a family, like to buy a patch each time my daughter completes the Junior Ranger program. You can see her patch for the night sky and for Death Valley National Park. The Junior Ranger program is a very educational program that teaches children and their parents all about the plants, animals, and history of the park. It also teaches children how they can help take care of the park and teach others to do the same. The more people know how special Death Valley National Park and all of our national parks and monuments are, the more people there will be to take care of them and enjoy them responsibly in the future. It is my favorite thing to do at each national park. Be sure to have your hat, a canteen full of water, sunscreen along with your Junior Ranger book and park map before heading out to explore. Here we are at my favorite place in Death Valley, Salt Creek. Right here in the middle of this hot desert is a stream where the rarest fish on the planet live. Can you guess? That's right, it's the pupfish. The Salt Creek pupfish actually only live in this stream. This is the only place on earth that you can find them. Pupfish are about one to three inches long and are called pupfish because they are active and energetic, just like puppies. Death Valley was once an ancient lake. As the conditions here changed and the lake dried up, these fish were isolated and confined to right here in Salt Creek. It can sometimes get saltier here than in the Pacific Ocean, although mostly it's fresh water. These little fish are tough. They not only withstand some super salty water, but also very high temperatures that range from 104 to 111 degrees. They also have to withstand pretty severe temperature changes, sometimes up to 36 degrees as it gets very cool at night in the desert. Pupfish make their home here at Salt Creek. Unlike my plushie here, pupfish are tiny, only one to three inches long, and the male pupfish are blue and purplish, and have a black tip on their tail fins, whereas the female pupfish are tan colored and blend in with the sand at the bottom of the creek. 
pupfish have to watch out for predators like the blue heron and raven who like to capture and eat pupfish. I have a new word I'd like to teach you. Can you say endemic? Pupfish are endemic to Death Valley. That means this species lives here and no other place on earth. Wow, have you ever seen anything like this? This is Ubahibi Crater, just one of the many gems here at Death Valley National Park. It is about 600 feet deep and a half a mile across. This crater formed because of volcanic explosion 3,000 years ago. When the hot magma from underground met the groundwater, it caused an explosion. It left this empty pit that's behind me. You can hike trails all the way down to the crater, around the crater, or to Little Ubahibi Crater right next to it. Badwater Basin, the lowest point of land in North America. Look up at the sea level sign, 282 feet. That means that this point here in Badwater Basin is 282 feet below sea level. The white stuff you see around me on the ground is salt. There's water here depending on the time of the year and the weather conditions. When there's flooding and water here, it doesn't stay long. It quickly evaporates. When there is water here, some of the salt that is already here dissolves and then is redeposited as clean sparkling crystals when the water evaporates. It's fun to walk around the white salt flats when there isn't any water. Artist Drive is a nine mile drive through the most colorful parts of Death Valley National Park. Artist Palette, behind me, is located along Artist Drive. You can see these beautiful colors all along the nine mile drive. The rock walls here have lots of color. Which colors do you see? The colors are at their best in late afternoon. Geologists, scientists who study rocks and earth materials, are still exploring the oxidation of different metals like iron oxides, magnesium, mica, and copper, which is why you see colors here on these rocks. It looks like an artist's palette, doesn't it? This is a great place to look down at the Badlands. Very few plants grow here. It's fun to look at all the strange shaped rock formations along the sides of these mountains. These formations have been here for millions of years. Let's go take a look. at the Harmony Borax Works. Borax was mined in Death Valley in the 1880s. Borax is salt and this is the place a man named Aaron Winters found borax in 1881. He sold his claims to William Coleman who built the Harmony Borax Works where I stand now. Here you can see the adobe walls that are crumbling and the vats and the old broiler. You can also see the wagons that were once used for transporting borax out of Death Valley. These wagons were pulled by 20 mule teams. You can drive down 20 mule team canyon if you want to get a sense of the landscape that the mules had to contend with in the 1880s. We're at the Mesquite Flat Sand Dunes and this is a great place for you kiddos to roll down the dunes, run down the dunes, slide down the dunes. The sand is very fine and it's made from pulverized mountains that have been broken down. It's gorgeous to see the mountains on the horizon and the sun hitting the sculptured sand dunes. Hardly any rain falls here. The mountains keep out moist air and low rain clouds. The air is so dry that the soil crumbles and turns into sand. The wind 
blows the sand and creates hills that we call sand dunes. Sand is everywhere in the desert, but sand dunes are not. For sand to gather into dunes, it takes three things. Supply of sand, strong wind, and something to slow that wind. One of the animals that lives here is the kangaroo rat. To escape surface temperatures of nearly 200 degrees, most animals escape to underground dens. Temperatures there are considerably cooler and increased humidity helps conserve body moisture. Only at night do most dune residents, like the snake, come out to gather food and socialize. During winter and spring, lizards and beetles share the dunes with humans attracted to the deceptively desolate beauty. Here in Titus Canyon, you can see petroglyphs. Did you know that people long ago shared messages to each other by drawing pictures on rocks? Today, we use phones, emails, letters, music, dance, and a variety of other ways to communicate. Here you can see a very old drawing. This is called the pictograph. What colors do you see? Now, you may be wondering, what is the difference between a petroglyph and a pictograph? A petroglyph is an image carved, incised, or scratched into stone. A pictograph is a painting on stone using natural pigments. In Death Valley National Park, there are more petroglyphs than pictographs. At least four Native American cultures lived in Death Valley and the surrounding area. The Timbisha Shoshone people arrived about a thousand years ago. These petroglyphs, or rock engravings, are two to three thousand years old. These petroglyphs have been preserved because many of the rocks have something called desert varnish on them. It is deposited by a certain type of bacteria that collects on iron, manganese, and clay that are needed to make the varnish. A great book to read about these images is called Cave Art, the first paintings by Vishaka Chanchani. This will give you a great background about our early ancestors and the evolution of their communication. Remember not to touch or draw on or over these petroglyphs. We want them to mark history and to enjoy them only with our eyes and preserve them for others to see and enjoy. Thank you for joining me today. Remember to like and subscribe to support our channel.